So, how did you first get to know John David Taylor? Well, he turned up when we were there living in Mansfield Gardens. We lived in the same house as the boys, the ant boys and Lucian, up the road from other boys. And he simply turned up with a letter of introduction to us from Auden. And then I'm trying to think how it would have been that he met various people in England. And this is guesswork, so we've got to check on this. But there was a, a club for officers run by friends of all of us, and Stephen used to perform there and so on, in uh, Westminster School, and it was called the Churchill Club. And it was for people who were interested in uh, music, literature, uh, philosophy, whatever. And uh, we all used to do our performances there. And I remember John coming with us to, um, to the Churchill Club. So he may have made some contacts there that I don't remember. I remember his becoming a friend of ours very soon after that. And then in 1945, uh, my son Matthew was born, and at that moment we moved into this house. And he came to see us a lot here. But in 1945, he was probably already in control commission or something, wasn't he? Where did he live when he was in London? He probably lived in some Air Force establishment. He was for a time at the Control Commission School. From this was the 14th to the 27th of March, 1945. And that was at Prince Albert Road in Regent Park. Just here. So that, that was March, that was the two weeks in March, 1945. Well, that was just when Matthew was born. Uh, we would have moved in here. Uh, what some okay? Visits okay. <coughs> were at the YSCA in Avenue Road. Oh yes, it's all in our history. Okay, so that really is not too far. So that was that you already moved here. But he'd been in England some time before that. He'd been in England from. And I have to begin to up the date. Um. He gathered the total history to me, and I've been looking at a great many archives. He first applied to join the Royal Canadian Air Force in September 1940. Mm -hmm. He was x-rayed and shadows were seen on his lungs, and then he was sent to a Rutland Sanatorium in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. He was then discharged after nine months. Then he's back in Canada, in 1941, and from 41 to November 42, he's on the books at the University of Toronto. And in the first, then in November 42, he enlists in the Royal Canadian Air Force, when he's sent to Halifax, Nova Scotia. So I know he was also in Montreal, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and there's various missions to the States, and I think on one of these missions, he then met um, uh, with Lord. Um, Do you think he didn't meet him before? They weren't both teaching at Swarthmore. No. 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 Certainly Mr. Lord was. Yes. Um, so he could have known him before. No. Uh, Swarthmore was where they made friends. I'm fairly certain about that. You'd have to check, but that's what I always understood. Now, I tell you where you might get more information yeah. is it, the papers of um, Jimmy Stern are now in the British Library. Right, yeah. I'm going to go and see them because there's a whole lot of letters from my sister in law to uh, Jimmy. But I remember Jimmy and Tanya talking about John quite a bit. I mean, they knew him quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And there was this place, well, it was a place that, um, it was a sort of shack that Liston and the Stearns 
shed on Fire Island. And they, I, I have a, a memory, which you would have to check on, yeah. that they met um, John at Fire Island. Before the war? Or oh, yes. I mean, or during the war. And they knew the whole, there was a whole story about he had trouble with some student who complained about him. And that, but I think that was from Harvard. And they knew all about that. Tanya was a very, very, uh, she was the sort of person that people relied on in Tanya. The students complained about? About John. He had some sort of trouble. Well, what was he doing before he went to Canada? Was he there at Harvard? He was at Harvard, absolutely. Um, I don't know how much you know about his earlier career. Do you, do, you, do you? Not a lot. I know that his family were in Mexico, weren't they, for some reason. His father was a mathematician. That's right. Um, about his mother. I know nothing about his mother. I don't think. What? She, she loved playing the piano, his mother. Ah. Very musical. And I think taught all the children to love and appreciate music. Um, but, um... But now, what, what age was he? He was born in 1906. I see, so he's older than Stephen. Stephen was born in 1909. And he was one year older than Winston. Did John talk about his education at all? Not a lot. No. But he did talk about his time at Harvard. And I remember very little about it except that there was some trouble with some student who complained about him. And uh, I don't remember more than that, but I remember that Tanya Stern knew about all that. Uh, they were rather, they were very sympathetic about it. They thought he'd been treated rather badly. So it, maybe that has to be before he went to Canada. Yes, absolutely. But it was in Canada that he was converted to Catholicism, wasn't it? Yes. And what's the date of that? Uh, the date I had is 1944, uh, around October 44. Oh, um, after he was working there. After he was working with the uh, um, physiologist. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I see. And um, someone called Edward Keelan of the Pacific for many years it started at Toronto um, over for its conversion. The yeah. other people involved at this institute was uh, Jacques Maritain. Well, was he in Canada? Maritain was, uh, was he, he divided was his time between Princeton. New York, Princeton, and uh, Canada, and yeah. Toronto. So, whatever, Gilleson. Hmm? Gilleson. Oh, uh, Etienne, Etienne yes. Gilleson, yes. yes. The other leading writers. Um, but he may well have had contact with the uh, cabinet circles previously. Uh, you have to speak up for the camera over there. Yes, he may well have had contact with um, Roman Catholic circles previously. Yes. Did John talk about Edinburgh at all? Well, yes, he did. Now, had he, did, was some of his education in Edinburgh? He studied medicine in Edinburgh. Ah, uh, yes. He went on a... Well, that must have been in the 30s. Yeah. Um, from around... It was between 1930 and about 1935. Except that he spent two years at Swarthmore while doing his Edinburgh degree. Well, but that's when he knew Whistler. Yeah, but 
this wasn't a portable then, so that doesn't quite... Well, then, he, then it must have been when he came in. Yeah. I do think that, you, that it may well be that some of this can be filled in by Jimmy and Sam. Oh, yes, because okay. um, I remember they're talking about about Swarthmore. I don't think it was just, a, as it were, a very short meeting with Swarthmore. With they were, for some time, they coincided in Swarthmore. And you, I mean, what would have been the basis of the friendship between John and Swarthmore? Well, it, it, I don't know if he was then religious. It might have been religion. You see, I found there were three people with whom I had, as it were, a, a link about religion. One was Winston himself, but that was only after the war because I only met him in the The other was John, and the other was a poet in Cambridge called Francis Crawford, who was, in fact, the granddaughter of Charles Darwin, um, but had, who'd become religious. In fact, she was... Um, very uh, instrumental in my being that part, that size. Anyway, we'll go to, I mean, that's by the way. But I introduced John to, to um, uh, Francis, and they became great friends. And she had um, Sebastian to stay in Cambridge. Anyway, that's jumping, chronologically yeah. jumping. So perhaps we ought to go back to... Sorry. <laughs> well... Uh, what I'm not much helped you about is how much we saw John un until we moved into this house, uh, which was in fact the, the, around VE day. Matthew was born on the 13th of March, so I was back here by the 27th of March. Um, but I had, we'd been seeing Stephen at uh, where we lived before in Nursefield Gardens. Uh, I mean, John. But then I think he went abroad soon after that, as indeed did Stephen. And that's how they, in, in uniform, met and sort of did this journey together, because they were already friends. And because there was always such a lucky dip about getting cars in, in Germany immediately after the end of the war. Do you know what month it might have been in 1945? I think it might have been something like May. But the um, European witness would tell you, okay. because that's uh, the account of Stephen's control commission. Did Stephen, did your husband do two journeys in Germany? Yes, he did. Wait a minute. And, and that's why I was interested. Do you think John might have been on the first or the second of these journeys? Um, I... I think it would have been the first, but you know, we can look in the biography. I think it's, there, there may be something in the biography. I forget sometimes I details like that, and John Trouble is very really good at it. Yes, but he, uh, okay. Um, I mean, John Trouble is invisible in, in your husband's book, in your husband's biography. Is he? Yes. He's he not is. in the. He does not appear. I'm mean, sure of that. I think the problem is that people can't place him, so he can... No, I don't think it's that. I think it is. I mean, I think, uh, and there was quite a, a, a discussion about that. John really, sh John Sutherland really should have had enough room to have two volumes, but publishers won't do two volumes now. So a lot of people just disappear because it has to be cut. Okay. What was the basis of the friendship? With your husband? Well, I think it was more all three of us. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, you know, you have to look at, um, that's all in the British Library, what Stephen wrote about Germany. They were both extremely interested in the future of Germany. And it's very difficult to realize now how, what nonsensical ideas there, there were amongst the Allies. But nothing, you know, that, that 
Germany was irredeemable and so on. And the idea that, that you could admit that anything good could, could come out of Germany was quite... Uh, they had to be argued against. I showed some of Stephen's essays about Germany afterwards, and, and John and he certainly talked a great deal about the future of Germany. Did the, I mean, did the, the learning about the Holocaust come in? Well, uh, John actually went to various concentration camps, didn't he? And Stephen also saw concentration camps, and I gave a, a concert in Belton when I was on a, on a concert tour for the um, Malcolm Clubs. Malcolm Clubs were, were RAF clubs, and one gave concerts for the officers, but I also gave a concert at Belton in the hospital, at Lynn Hughes Hospital. Um, when was that? Well, that would have been later. That would have been September 1945. But presumably the, the survivors would still have been very, very troubled and very... Awful. The survivors, uh, survivors were, it was a hospital. Yeah. It was run by a marvellous Polish woman doctor, Dr. Fushoba. The, mostly, they were mostly Poles who were left. Somehow, by that time, um, some other of the um, people recovering had already got home again. But the Poles were rather out on the limb. They wore their impeccably laundered um, um, concentration camp uniforms with the grey and mauve stripes with pride and it was, it was a very strange day. Anyway, Stephen and I, um, coinc we weren't in Germany together, but once or twice we coincided accidentally. And um, now I don't know where John was at that moment, but I know that, that that's what Stephen and he had in common, but was the future of Europe. And the did John ever talk about the, um, his care for the survivors of the Holocaust? Or? Oh, yes. And also, John persuaded us to um, take, as it were, sight unseen, a displaced person from a displaced person's camp who became our au pair girl. Who was, she was called Leah. Leah Tina. And she came from, I I think Lithuania, this we'd have to check, it was a border state anyway. And so he was touring those clubs at that time, those um, camps at that time. And then uh, she lived in this house for, well, coming on for two years, I think. And then when we went to America, we passed her on to another friend, uh, Mrs. Lennox yes. Barclay because she couldn't get into America. And, uh, but she became a great friend of Sebastian's, and that was also through Frances Cornford. Now, Frances Cornford's papers are in the British Library, but I, d I don't think I've seen anything relating to, to John. I do remember taking John up to Cambridge to meet her, Um, did, did John also meet the, the Fitzwells? I don't remember, no, and I would have to try and check up, but all our correspondence with the Fitzwells is partly in this archive yeah. and partly in New York Public Library. And I don't remember Edith talking about her, but e Edith was uh, the godmother to, to Matthew. Now, did John come to Matthew's christening? That I don't remember either. 
Die wird noch die Gottfälle. Gottfälle war Edith und Christoph Gerson und Edward Selwyn und William Blumer. Well then, uh, the interesting thing was that, that he had this sort of friendship, not a, uh, with me and with other people I introduced to him. But um, one felt one had to help whatever he was doing, and he would ring up or or send a telegram or something. And whatever he asked one to do, one would do it. And I remember that soon after the E day, I mean, must have been a month or two after the E day, I, I suddenly had a telegram <laughs> saying, can you please send a birthday cake and two violin bows? <laughs> this was for one of his protégés, you know. In the, I don't know whether it was in the camps or what it was, but some talented person he was rescuing. So they went off the very next day. One did whatever he wanted. And uh, I think he brought other displaced people to England, but Leah, of course, was the one that we remembered. Your husband helped. Some, uh, a boy called Rudy with penicillin. Mm. Now, how do you know that? It's in the uh, biography, isn't it? Yes. I was just wondering whether um, uh, he maintained any contact with Rudy. Oh, no, I um, don't think so, no. No. No, that was very sort of en passant. <laughs> But you, you have to get yourself into the atmosphere of those times. They were, everybody felt psychologically in a state of emergency. Emergency about helping people um, who were far flung or people who uh, people had just run into in the course of their service overseas. There was something very... Uh, uh, you know, from day to day about it. And that's why um, um, your husband actually went to Germany to... Well, he was in control commission. His job was to um, inspect libraries. But did he see himself having a, a good day? This was an opportunity for, uh, to, take a, uh, to go beyond that. Well, about going beyond, he'd lived in Germany, as you know, before. Um, so he's very concerned. He was very concerned for the person who was the only person who'd really been his mentor, who was Hans Robert Kurtius, the professor in Bonn. But uh, as you will see in European Witness, he interviewed a whole lot of people, writers like Ernst Junger, and so on. Adenauer, he met because he was then there of Cologne, and so on. But you were, people here were in some way swimming against the tide if they wanted Germany to lift its head again. Uh, afterwards we can look at the articles that he has written at that time. Um, going back to the Freud, did uh, John have any contact with the Freud? Do you know, I don't remember. Now, how could we find that? I just, I just recently resigned from being on the committee of the Freud Museum, and so I've been writing for them um, my reminiscences of the Anna Freud nursery, wartime nursery, and so on. And it was Stephen who arranged that Anna Freud uh, gave one of the inaugural lectures for the beginnings of UNESCO, because he then had a job in UNESCO. Well, the, the preparatory commission, the chairman was Julian Huxley, and Stephen was in the section of letters. 
and his job was to arrange a series of lectures. And one of the lectures he arranged was Anna Boyd, and she gave a lecture on children in wartime. And it was very, very impressive. I should imagine she's a wonderful person. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It was lovely to have met her. She was a great friend of ours. Um, because, uh, partly through the family connection, I mean, because we lived in Aunt's house and we used to go and have tea with her, but also because we tried to raise money for her nursery because the maddening thing about her nursery was that she didn't get the usual help from the authorities in England because she ran the, the nursery too well. So she got money from the Lord Mayor's fund, because they could choose what they did with it, but otherwise not, or from Americans. I mean, Mrs. Roosevelt was very good and raised money for the nursery, and we tried to get various of our, I think we succeeded, I don't remember, the philanthropic friends to contribute to the nursery. And so uh, when... Uh, 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 well, she gave us advice about various things, the sister-in-law of ours who was extremely ill and whether she should adopt a child. And uh, then when I was expecting Matthew, <laughs> she said, well, don't you want to come and learn how to look after a baby? So I worked in the Android nursery until Matthew arrived. I know that Clement Freud worked under John Thompson for a while in Nuremberg. Oh, oh, did he? That's very interesting. Um, I didn't really see so much of Fred Lucien as our friend. Mm -hmm. uh, Who, was Lucien Freud also with us? Did he also do military service? No. What happened was, um, he did, uh, he was a merchant seaman. He did, he did a crossing of the Atlantic as a merchant seaman. But when his tribunal came up for military service, he was rejected. I think for medical reasons. I can't remember. But he didn't do military service. Did Stephen, his older brother, did he do military service? He was a... I was... Um, the way I got into this area was uh, a, a friend to the, um, there were some records of the Pasteur Institute, and there were a number of names. It was a commission that met in 1946, in July 46, and um, John Thompson had organized it, and there was a, a British military pathologist called Keith Matt, and Keith told me, about John Thompson, so he was the key person in the school and um, the most brilliant person he had ever known. And also mentioned um, Kenneth kind of Freud, who oh, also yeah. worked with him, who assisted them in sorting documents about war crimes, medical war crimes. Now, I think it might have been through Stephen that John got to know um, somebody who was on the straight sort of neurological psychology side who worked at the Collège de France called Yves Gallifre. And does he come, have you heard his name? Definitely, he is in Texas. That's right. Well, he was a great friend of ours, and in fact I saw him about, I don't think he can still be alive. But he became, he was a pupil of Piero, I mean, what you call assistant of Piero, and uh, he was, in fact, um, their subject was the eye. People like uh, Richard Gregory and so on, they know a lot about um, Piero. But uh, uh, academic life in France is such that very often the underlings do all the work and, and the papers are published under the name of your patron. So a lot of the stuff that E. Gallifrey did was um, came on, uh, was published under the name of Pierron, but he succeeded Pierron as the professor at the College of France, 
And at that time, because well, I saw him about ten years ago, just a little bit more, it was during Stephen's lifetime. And I, in the meantime, I was, as an ex-musician, I'd taken a psychology degree and my interest was the ear, obviously, and um, psychology of music. And it turned out that Eve Gallifrey had switched to the ear from the eye because he said that neurologically it was more interesting. Um, that's to sort of say that there were still great questions to be answered about the neurology and the psychology of the ear. But he used to see John when John was living in Paris. And I think they belonged to the same club, I didn't know, I mean, some sort of social club. I don't know what it was. So the letters to Sebastian first he mentioned Eve, and the name come up. Ah, oh, yes. So I'm glad he placed it, so thank you. Um. Well then, uh, to, to come back to the war, and then John being in, in Europe, and then he used to turn up. I never knew when or who he was going to see. He was mostly when he was here not so much interested in in poets as in uh, sociologists. There was somebody called uh, is there a sociologist called Mannheim? Yeah. That's right. He was very keen on I mean I think for quite a bit of Mannheim. was that Mannheim in England? At the at the LSD. That's right. Well, he was one of the people. Uh, um, John was and I would see that, wouldn't you? That I mean, his work had become so much with um, with the uh, decay, as it were, of society in Germany after the war, and rescuing all these people that he rescued. I mean, they were all rather spectacular. Um, um, what's the name? I mean, um, people who got into that situation because of the war, like Sebastian. And what about uh, Isaiah Berlin? Yeah. 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 He could have seen. Now, Isaiah's papers are now at the. Um, yeah, at the Bodleian. Uh, in fact, I was there last Friday. <laughs> I didn't notice John Thompson's name again because I went through. Oh, I've got the list here. Oh, but it wouldn't have names because I think you can get it on your computer. I cannot. Yeah, you can because I've got the instructions for how to get into the internet. Well, you probably know how to do that. I don't I remember. I just wondered whether, because I, is it right that. Um, your husband knew Isaiah Berlin. Extremely well. Yeah. You see, they were undergraduates together. And uh, Isaiah, when he, as an undergraduate, edited his Oxford Outlook, and Stephen wrote for it. And this is in 1929, 1930. And so they were lifelong friends. And um, we did an exchange of letters for the archive, and so there was a great deal of letters to and from Stephen in the first volume of the Isaiah Berlin letters. And a lot of people said, he might even have said himself, that Stephen being living in Germany, whilst Isaiah was either at All Souls or at New College, that it is contact with the real horrors of the advance of the Nazis was through Stephen and through the letters that Stephen wrote him. But I don't remember, I don't remember Isaiah ever talking about John Thompson. I mean, John Thompson certainly met Isaiah, I yeah. John Thompson is scheme for um, a, what's a, 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 a European, it's like a European university. Oh, yeah. That, was, that he hoped would be cited in Germany. Yes. And so he was very keen in the summer of 46 not to be demobilized, but to keep on doing this work. I see. Um, 
then I suppose the question is, is whether his work for UNESCO was in a way the follow-up in his initial... Oh, now I do remember that he met Julian Huxley to us. I have the dimmest memory of their meeting here in this house. But that may very well be, because Julian was a terrific, live, imaginative um, uh, person who, um, who gathered people around him because of, of uh, seeing eye to eye, who was completely, really, unpolitical but was ousted from um, UNESCO by the Americans on the grounds that he was soft on communism. Well, I mean, he didn't really care either way uh, if somebody was, for instance, the, um, the head of the section of letters in, in uh, at UNESCO was a man called Anton Swarming, who was Swarming, who was a Pole. And of course he was a, a communist, because he couldn't exist if he wasn't although he was not as hard a communist, but you see the Americans would have seen that as uh, being soft on communism. They had a very sort of cut and dried attitude. They didn't understand about um, people who, who um, weren't out and out victims of the system. So when could John have met Julian Huxley? That would have been here. Roughly. I would think why do I think it's in this house? You see, my memory is very, very vague. But, now, Julian's papers are in that. So, right. That's right, that's right. Um, yes, I also, but you would have to check on this, because it's such a vague memory. I remember Juliet. Huxley, um, talking about John. What? I think Julia Huxley talking about Julian's wife. Yeah. Did she like John? I think she did. But again, you must check because this is very vague, this moment. I mean, I have the impression that temperamentally, John Thompson and Julian Huxley would have been very different. Different? Yeah. Because? Why? Because I think Julian Huxley was uh, still committed to biology and was working within a biological framework and for a sort of had an interest in ethics, but it was a biologically based ethics, whereas John oh, no, but by then has moved out of his, I mean, has come through biology, but was moving into this idea of really last of religion and, and human contact is the basis of moving out of the science. Stephen, you just think of a joke that, that Thomas Huxley got rid of religion and that his descendants were trying to get back, get it back in in various ways. So that Aldous had his, uh, you know, um, what was it called? Um, well, he, you know, he used to go to Ohio and this, uh, um, really he was interested in Eastern religions and Julian invented a religion which was evolutionary humanism. <laughs> Did you know all the facts as well? Oh yes. But only they, well, we used to meet him when he came here. Then we got to know him very well when we were in um, California. But uh, Stephen and all orders were friends from when Stephen was very, very young and he met Aldous at uh, Ottilie Morrow at Darsington. So, um, John and your husband would also met in Paris? Yes. A number of times? 
Well, we didn't have to really have to look it up, weren't we? Is there a diary? Oh, Stephen has diaries, but I don't think uh, the diaries have mostly been published. Yeah. We're looking to publish. Then I've got other things in the archives, but I'm not sure that I can I can search because the I think if there is a diary of that time, it will be in the ones that are in Berkeley. And then, you kept in touch with John while he was working for you no. uh, Oh yes, yes. Well, I, and I went, because he started OVs soon after he started in UNESCO, didn't he? What's the date of that? Okay. Um, I now have a... I was recently in touch with the French Dominican Order. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Paul Soir. And they sent me a document which actually takes a lead back to the 15th of April, 1945 which is the date of the liberation of Belgium. It's interesting. And there's a French counter who chairs the governing body of OB. Her name is, um, she's the Countess de Cossé. Oh, yes. Now, is she the person who owns the big house at OB? Well, I don't know. You see, that I do know that John simply found that there was this large abandoned house and went to the owners and said, I want to use it as a place for people to have a retreat or whatever, just to help people who are victims of the war in various ways. And that was next to Aviv? Yes. Aviv. Have you not been to Aviv? No. It was a huge, rather ramshackle house, and it had cottages in the woods. Mm. And somehow, I have a vague memory, you walk through the woods to get to Sirshwa. And so the people came, if they were Catholics, they came to Oviv, they lived in Oviv, and then they just camped through the woods to the various offices of Sirshwa. And in fact, uh, one of the people who used to come out mostly at weekends uh, was the, the papal nuncio, who used to stop about in his carpet slippers and make breakfast for the people who came back from the early morning office because he'd already done his mass, his early morning mass, and he would be there making tea for everybody, and that was Pope John the Twenty Third. You were there when Angelo Roncalli. Roncalli, Roncalli, yes. Were you there? I was there one day when uh, I didn't actually see him because I think I arrived at the day, the day that he had gone back to Paris or something. But everybody was talking about, you know, who was that old man who was making tea for us all? The answer was the Papal Nuncio. But you never knew at, at OVs. And in fact, you see, I was like a cap and junction for John, because if people were having difficulties about their life in various ways, it was the one, I, I knew it, I knew about it, and I had seen it. And I knew that it was somebody somewhere where people could go and be quiet and collect their thoughts and possibly talk to John. And so Alison Hooper, was um, one of the people, uh, I'll tell you about that, and then later Marjorie, because Alison and I were um, on our way to a, a holiday in Sicily, which had been arranged by her, she was not quite with her husband, they separated, um, but he was a shipping owner, and so he arranged with his agent in Sicily, that we should have um, 
but, you know, facilities for a holiday, she and I together. And um, in those days, you couldn't, there was no direct flight from here to Sicily. And Steve, and uh, so Alice and I were, um, we got, I think, three hours, or perhaps a bit more, to wait around in Orly. So I rang John, and he said, oh, I'll come and have lunch with you. <laughs> So, in fact, I introduced Alison to um, John, and apparently, immediately went off and powdered my nose, and Alison said, uh, immediately attacked him about religion, and said, uh, roughly, her argument was, there's a, there's a point for everything and everybody in this world, yet, well, what is the point of my mother? She's been an entirely selfish person. She's never done anybody any good at so on. <laughs> As I came back to the table, John was saying, well, perhaps your mother was sent to teach you patience. <laughs> and they became great friends immediately. And uh, I think, I can't remember if she went to stay. Um, Jeremy would tell you that, whether she went to stay at O.B. But then the other thing was Marjorie, who's come, who was taking a sabbatical from Australia and coming to Paris and had settled in Paris. And I think she was very keen on somebody, but I don't remember that. But I know that when she came to Paris, something that she planned didn't come into, um, uh, didn't happen, you know. And she was really very talked and, and um, sex, you know. And so I suggested to her, oh, I've got this friend who's got a, an annex to a Dominican monastery, and you can go and be quiet there for a week. Why not do that instead of sacking about, you know. So I was also responsible for Marjorie getting to know John. How do you know Marjorie? Well, I did a concert tour with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra in... Um, what has happened was that I've done um, a concerto here at very short notice, a tour with the Birmingham Orchestra, and Eugene Goosens was the guest conductor, and I'd never met him until, you know, in fact, I don't think we had a, a rehearsal even, it was such a crisis. So I went straight onto the stage and played Mendelssohn in G minor with this conductor, and then after the concert, we were both invited to dinner with a friend of his called Olive Marshall. She comes into the Christopher Isherwood um, life story because he was secretary of her, to her husband. But anyway, uh, and uh, then it turned out that, um, that Eugene Goosens had been very much helped in his career by my father. I didn't know my father. I mean, it, it, when people told me about the wonderful things my father did, it was always news to me. And so we became, we did, I think, three more concerts with the Birmingham Orchestra. And, uh, and he liked that. I played the, um, uh, that and the Greek concerto. And so then I was offered this tour with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. And that's where I, I met Marjorie in London, in fact. But then I really got to know her well, because I went out to stay with her. She lived somewhere just outside Sydney. And uh, there was a gap between concerts, and I went and stayed with her and got to know her. And I used to see her in London quite a bit. And so that's how she got to know John Thompson. Okay. Um, um, Rene became John Ward. Yeah, you see, people had tremendous um, confidence in John. And was that, do you think that was Marjorie? Do you think that was I'm sure it was Marjorie's suggestion. Oh, I would think so. Or? I don't think, I don't know, I mean, probably this book would tell me, but I have a sort of feeling that Gene was really, seemed rather removed from his children. He seemed rather, um, he was very, very into his work. I mean, he was either uh, conducting or he was composing. Uh, 
Um, and I think it was quite hard for Jean to go, uh, for Marjorie rather, because she had these two children who were with Jean, who probably were missing their own mother, who knows. Um, so she probably had a very hard road to hoe, I would think. The older one became the harpist in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, I think, didn't she? Uh, but Rene uh, really didn't ever get comfortable, I had the impression, in Australia. And that's why she came with Marjorie to, to Europe. Or probably Marjorie also felt that she'd have a better education in Europe, I don't know. Anyway, I'm much looking forward to reading this book. Can you lend it to me or not? Yeah, I'll lend it. Okay, good. And, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? So, um, there was a believe, um, when did you first visit O'Neill, John O'Neill? Well, I must have first visited it. Was it going in 1946? Yeah. Yeah. It was, was it? Yeah. Well, you see, I used to go and stay with the Huxleys. Uh, there was one time when I stayed with Julian and Juliet, and I must have gone out to O'Neill then. Did he join her? Did he meet anyone else? Well, not anyone that I remember, aside from Matthias and Sebastian. Sebastian had some quite other name. Sebastian was... He was re-christened Sebastian, but... Right. What was he called? Klaus. Klaus. And he became very chummy, as I said, with Leah, with the... Uh, my au pair girl. And they all, all used to say with, with Francis Cornford. Now there's nobody of the France, of the Francis's Fran children alive now except I think the son in law. I can try and find out for you about him. He's called Cecil Chapman. But all Francis's children have died. Her grandson, who is the son of um, John Cornford, her son who was killed in Spain. Now he might know something about Francis's friendship with John, because it was quite um, serious. She was very, very taken with John, and you know they had, as it were, religion together between them. Was very, you say, interested in the mystical aspects of religion, or the, the, the positive way of helping other people? She came to it. Now, yes, have you ever read a book called, um, hold on, um, it's a book by Gwen Ravara and it's about Cambridge, and it's illustrated. Gwen Ravara was also a granddaughter of Charles Darwin, and was the first cousin of Francis, and she was married to a, a painter called Jacques Ravara, and uh, she did a charming book, and I remember the title later on, and there was a wonderful illustration in it about France is taking um, Gwen for a walk when she was a child in order to divulge that there is no God. And then there's a sort of remark that says, poor old Francis, he got her in the end, meaning God got her in the end, because Francis remained very Darwinian. <laughs> I mean, not Francis, I mean Gwen remained very Darwinian. But now John went quite a bit, and it is worth your trying to follow that up, because he did go and see Francis's husband, 
was the professor of tactics, the Regis professor of tactics at Cambridge. And we met them when Stephen and I, when we were on our honeymoon at Darcy um, But I think John might have just met him. He died quite early. Uh, Gilbert Murray. Oh well, like he was the professor of Greek at Oxford. Yeah. The well, Stephen knew his son, you see. Yeah. But that's when he was very young. I don't think we saw um, Gilbert Murray. Mm -hmm. Did Gilbert Murray? Who did he? Yes. When he was in Oxford. When that Murray means? was, I think, supporting the development of UNESCO and oh, the United yes. Nations. Yeah. Now, where will I find? Well, I think it's wor really worth looking at Julian's okay. papers. Yeah. Who's done? Somebody must have done a, a biography. There is no good biography of Catherine uh, Holland. Um, I have done some work at the um, writing of those things. At where? At Rice. And oh, yes. There is a tiny bit of correspondence about care parcels uh, between John Helden and Julian who actually displays the care parcels. It's very cordial correspondence. Yes. It's a rightly consistent and uh, um, but, uh, and I went back to the correspondence in around 42, but I'd like to go back to some of the Oh, to go back to Edith Fitzwater, she and I had, um, but she being Matthew's godmother, I mean, she, she was marvellous in my life, in uh, tremendously helping me with the phase of bereavement after the death of my, sister, my beloved sister-in-law, about whom Stephen wrote all those poems called the Elegy of the Margaret. And, um, why am I telling you this? Because that might have been the link. I mean, it's always possible that, that uh, John got to know Edith through that link. Does John appear in any of your husband's poems? No. There's no literary. And did John ever show your, um, evening of his own writing? No. And I remember when, uh, when he died, there was really quite a lot. I remember talking to Luke Rosenbaum about uh, and everybody was uh, uh, appalled by the fact that he'd been this brilliant, um, um, figure, and yet that there was very little, uh, record of it. I did now, to go on with my history, um, I saw John a bit when he was at the Warnford, and that's when he was a friend of John Webster, and this man, I told you, Brian Kelly. You were talking about um, Brian Kelly and the organist. Uh, yes. Did John come to your concert? I expect he did, yes, if he was in England. Yes. Now, um, of course, Wilson became a great friend of, of, of uh, Webster and Kelly, too. I might find out from David Luke. He might know. That's right. I could bring David Luke. I think I've got David Luke. Remember, he's, he became a great friend of uh, Janet. I haven't got a telephone number, damn it. Any other person I'd like to know about is... Mrs. Layard. Well, now, I met Mrs. Layard with John, but this, uh, um, and she was a pretty steady member of the New Bridge. But we became interested in the, I mean, we became very early founder members of the New Bridge through, excuse me, <coughs> uh, through 
Our Stephen's friendship with Lady Longford, you see, Frank and Elizabeth were friends last at the year dog. Elizabeth Longford and Stephen, as undergraduates, had run the English Society at Oxford together. So we were very old friends of Elizabeth, and indeed she was a patron of the Stephen Spender Memorial Trust. Uh, anyway, when Edward and Michael Pitt Rivers and uh, Peter Wilder came out of prison, we, we were all uh, sort of involved in starting this group to help ex-prisoners get back into society because it was sort of catch twenty two situation where they couldn't get help they couldn't get on to help if they had if they didn't have an address. But they couldn't get a, an address until they um until they had some money to pay for the rent. And there were all sorts of things like that about ex prisoners that uh, that uh, Pitt Rivers and Montague and so on, they got very involved with when they were in prison. How, how impossible it was for people who had no background to get back into earning their living and getting back into society. Do you remember what year that was? No, but I could find out. I could look it up.